there's a wonderful line by the poet Meryl Rukeyser, the world is not made out of atoms, it's made out of stories. Change their lives for the better. Human tendency is to, is to, uh, is to hope. But the stories we tell about who we are shape our lives. My name is Jean Wakotsky Houston, and I'm the author of Farewell to Manzanar with my husband, James D. Houston. Farewell to Manzanar is actually uh, a memoir of the story of my life and my family's life during the Second World War when uh, we lived in a, well, we, some people call it concentration camp or internment camp for individuals of Japanese descent during the Second World War. And um, so, it, it, you know, I wrote the book with my husband. And actually, it was quite a while after the war was over. It was at least 35 years. And it came really out of nowhere, so to speak. And uh, I could tell a story about how the book came about. Would, would that be all right? Okay. This was in 1981, and I mean, excuse me, 1973, and my uh, nephew, who had been born in camp, and for those of you who've read the book, there is a chapter there where my sister goes in the hospital and, on Christmas Day and is in labor for three days, and finally a son is born. Well, that <coughs> baby grew up, and he was. Uh, at Berkeley, at, in, uh, at the University of California. And he came by one day, and he said to me, um, Auntie, you know, uh, I was born in a place called Manzanar, and for the first time, you know, outside of our family, I heard the word Manzanar. And, uh, I, I just, you know, I was born there, and nobody talks about it. What can you tell me about it? And so I just kind of laughed and said, oh, really? That's, I, you know, don't you ask your parents? And he said, yes, but they won't talk about it. And I said, well, that's odd. I'd be happy to tell you. So I began telling him about camp, about the dust storms, the lousy food, the games we played, the fire breaks, the schools, and uh, my nephew just sat there and looked at me. And you know, this was a kid out of the 60s. And he said, Auntie, you're talking about being imprisoned like it was nothing. I mean, how did you feel about that? And I stopped because this is the first time anybody had ever asked me how I felt. And I allowed myself to feel. And I just burst into tears. And I became hysterical. And my poor nephew, who, <coughs> who just asked his aunt a simple question, didn't know what he'd done to, to do this, and of course was very upset. I was upset, and I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, uh, I don't know what's happening, but since I can't seem to be talking about it, I'll write the story for the family. I'll write it for us. So I began going down to the beach, we live in Santa Cruz, go down to the beach, and uh, started writing out, <clears throat> you know, in a journal. I had majored in journalism. I had wanted to be a writer. I thought I could write. So I started uh, writing in this journal. But I found that every time I thought about it, I would cry, I would burst into tears. And I was so emotionally <coughs> overwrought that I, finally turned to Jim, my husband, who was teaching creative writing at UC Santa Cruz. And I said, you know what? I'm having trouble with this memoir I'm trying to write. And he said, what memoir? And at that time, Jim and I had been married for 15 years, 14 to 15 years. And I had never told him about Manzanar. He knew of some quote, camp in my background, but in those days, you know, the internment and what had happened to the Japanese Americans, I mean, it was just a no-no. No one talked about it, really. So uh, he 
was, so I realized I had never told him. And so for the first time, I was emotionally honest with him and began to tell him what had happened and how I really felt about it and why I couldn't seem to put it down. And he was so stunned. And he said, oh my God. He said, this isn't something for you to write for just your family. He said, this is something every American should read. Let me help you. Excuse me. That's how it began. Jim. And it took us about a year of interviewing. He interviewed me and talked to other members of the family. And we went to the libraries, checked the books, and, um, and then I, I, that took us about a year. And finally, we were able to get it down, you know, into a book. And he gave, he, he gave it to um, Houghton Mifflin at uh, San Francisco Book Company when they were here. And Ernest Scott loved it and said, I want to publish it. And that's how Farewell to Manzanar was born. But it came about in a very odd way in, in terms it had to be uh, remembered and experience, almost experienced again. We went down to camp, to the Manzanar camp. I had never been there. And I had never been back since. But to see where all these memories came from, we had to research so many other books, talk to other attorneys, those who would talk about it, and um, thus the book was born. And I felt that, uh, both of us felt, Jim and I felt, that we wanted to write a story that was about a family. And we did, it wasn't going to be a, uh, Oh, what is the word? We didn't want it to be a harsh book about being a victim or about, you know, human. Of course, about the humiliation, but it basically we wanted it to be an educational book because we realized there were no books out there already telling the story from a personal point of view of what does happen to a family, what happens to a young girl experiencing this, and. <clears throat> So that's, um, that was our motivation and, and uh, how we worked on it for that time. And we're, you know, today, I mean, I know that, you know, it is still being read even more. I went to Missouri, for the whole, to the whole state of Missouri a few years ago. That they, the state had chosen it as a community read. And I went to Missouri for about a week and went to all these little libraries and schools all over the state. They were such lovely people, and they were just so shocked. They didn't realize there were two of the camps right there next to them in Arkansas, you know, from Missouri. And so, and so, you know, I felt, and I feel today, that it's an important story because it really, it tells the story of the, for the, about America. One, two ways. One, first what happened, that for the first time in the history of our country, all three branches of the government violated the Constitution. They rounded up a group of people because of their race and because they might potentially be dangerous. Rounded them up and imprisoned them you know, in these camps for from one to three years. And uh, no one knew about it. So this was a great violation of democratic values of this country. Great, great violation. And uh, so that is why Several years later, when children of the internees went on the march, they, you know, this was when the civil rights movement happened, and they wanted to uh, rectify this, not only for their parents, their grandparents, for Japanese Americans, but for all peoples. 
so that this could not ever happen again. That without due process, I mean, you know, without being even, um, you know, without a court hearing, but just because of your race, that they could gather you together and take you someplace, you lose all your home, you lose all your uh, valuables, your car, your job, your life, stand still for three years, simply because you look like the enemy. And interestingly enough, you know, I don't know if I'm getting to, what do you call about this, but while we were in camp, this was a great issue about loyalty. And it, uh, there were, we had to sign loyalty oaths, et cetera. There were huge, you know, fights about that. But the fact of the matter is that many young men fought for this country and lost their lives because they had to prove that we were loyal. But that said, you know, uh, about what happened in camp and about writing about it, the fact remains today, and this is the positive of it, that the book was published it was made into a film. My husband and I traveled all throughout Southeast Asia and Asia giving talks about this, you know, through the government, went to the Philippines, all these places. And it was just so educating to see how people reacted to the, to the story. And if I can tell you about an experience that we had in the Philippines. Uh, and this was at the University of the Philippines, and it was a big class there, and they had seen the film, and we were talking about the book. And so somebody raised their hands and said, yeah, you know, that's all well and good about this film that you have done and you have shown, he said, but what did the real Americans think about it? Of course, what they, where she was coming from was white Americans, and so, just like, I don't know what gave me the insight to do this. And I said, you know what? I'm looking around in this room. You look Chinese. You look Spanish. You look like a native person. I said, which one of you is the real Filipino? And they got it. You see, and that, so that's one of the things that I, I, I want to say is that even though this happened to us by the government, it was a huge mistake. They knew it. It was rectified. And they felt strong enough to send Jim and I to other countries to show this film what had happened and also to read the book. And so that, that's something that, uh, in terms of our democracy that we have here, that I think we should cherish. You know, the fact that I could be on this program now and tell you about something that happened to our family that was, you know, illegal, it was so un-American, and uh, wrong in terms of American democracy and values, but yet it was rectified, you see, and here I am talking about it. And this is something I think that we must uh, look at and value of why we are different. Oh yes, because constantly America is a country of immigrants. So we have new people coming in all the time with cultural, you know, other cultural values and, and they look different languages and so forth. So what is it that binds us together as a country? You know, I, I liken ourselves to a tapestry in that we have all these threads going through that are different colors, different textures, and so forth. But what is the warp that holds us together? And that is what makes us American, and that is the belief in the Constitution of the United States, the belief in democracy, the belief in an, the identity, excuse me, of being an American. So 
maybe that's the big question. What is an American? Because maybe people have different ideas of what American is, but I do feel that um, in my own case, that I'm an American of Japanese descent and that I cherish this cultural, the cultural values that I have, you know, born down from my father and my grandparents, who I never met, who were in Japan, and I have, you know, I've inherited some of those values of that, and they've kind of mixed with these other values that we have, created all the time by other immigrants coming in, and by the basic one, which was English, European, uh, French, and so it's like all of these together. It's just like this wonderful tapestry. I mean, and that's what I feel I am, is a combination of that, you know. And it, sometimes when I give talks, people will say, ask me that question, well, what part of you is Japanese and what part of you is American? And I'll say, well, have you ever heard of a nectarine? You know, nectarine is a combination of them both, of a peach and a pear. And, but yet what comes out is this wonderful nectarine. It's so delicious, so different. And that's how I like to view myself or people, you know, Americans who, of different backgrounds who come here and they have, they, you know, have, quote, American values of liberty, independence, freedom, and they have this different look different way of presenting themselves. 